Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Our guest for tonight is Father Brian Harrison. He's a former Presbyterian. You noticed when you get a chance to see him here in a second, he's a, now a priest. So we're going to hear a long story of uh, Father Brian's journey from well, actually, you said you had more of an ecumenical background, that's, that's so we'll right. get into that. So let me first welcome <laughs> yeah. you to the Thank Journey Home Thank you very much, program. Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, it, it, I'm just glad to have you here because I've read your articles over the years, uh, both in uh, This Rock, right, and uh, 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 you said Homiletic Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Review, Review and a few so other so magazines. I've, so. I've, I've, I've heard you from afar, uh -huh. but not you had your, your regular story on the program. And so what we normally do in the Journey Home program is I invite the guests to kind of take a long step back to uh, let us know where you came from spiritually long before you right. had that collar around your neck. Right. <laughs> well, uh, I certainly had a, a long journey <laughs> to the Catholic Church, and uh, I had a very, let's say, an ecumenical upbringing. Uh, on my father's and mother's side, both they were all Blue Ribbon Methodists. In fact, my grandfather and great-grandfather were both, were both Methodist ministers. So I was baptized a, a Methodist, but then uh, a little after that, uh, my father uh, moved to live in a country town. I'm from, I was born in Sydney, Australia. And uh, the local Presbyterian church there needed a choir director. And my dad, well, there wasn't too much difference between Methodist, Presbyterian. Anyway, so he became a Presbyterian to become the choir director. And so I was brought up basically Presbyterian. <laughs> but on vacations, we used to go back to where my... Uh, parents' uh, families were, and we'd be Methodists for the summer vacation, then back to Presbyterian again in our hometown. Then I, I went to an Anglican boys' school for, for my high school education. And um, after I graduated from a university with my bachelor's degree in history, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do with my life, and so I decided to take out a couple of years teaching uh, with a group that's a little bit like the American Peace Corps. It's called Australian Volunteers Abroad mm -hmm. that sends volunteer workers to, to work in different um, uh, things in developing countries. So I went to Papua New Guinea. Oh. This We're talking about the, uh, the late 60s here, a long time ago now. Papua New Guinea was still an Australian territory at that stage. It's now independent. But I decided, well, I can, I, it'll be adventurous to go up to New Guinea because that was still uh, pretty... Uh, not only undeveloped, but re in the true sense of the word primitive in many se senses, particularly up in the central highlands of New Guinea. And uh, they said, well, look, uh, we have no Presbyterian missions going in New Guinea. We, d we do have a place for you with the Lutheran mission. And I said, well, fine, Lutheran, that's okay. So um, <laughs> uh, they're Protestant. And um, uh, so I, I was working with the, as a baptized Methodist, brought up Presbyterian, Anglican educated. I was now working with, <laughs> with the, the Lutheran, Lutheran mission as a lay uh, history teacher in, in, in a school up in the Central Highlands. I'm going to pause yeah. in there because that's interesting. You had mentioned earlier that, eh, there's not much difference in Methodist and Presbyterian. Well, what, what, you've got Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, and Lutheran. Uh -huh. Now, in the purest sense, very deeply committed Orthodox Methodists would be quite radically different than a deeply committed Orthodox Presbyterian Anglican and Lutheran, you know that. Yeah. And I'm wondering, when you look back, was it maybe the reason that they were so similar is because your experience of them where you were was that they weren't as, they may be yeah, on the liberal that's, side that's, of things. That's, well, well, they weren't doctrinaire. Um, uh, let's say I mean, the Methodists are very strong on free will and the Calvinists, of course, uh, <laughs> right, yeah. the, right, right, the opposite on that issue. But... Um, uh, in some cases, the, uh, no, the Presbyterian church that I went to was not particularly strict on yeah. Calvinist doctrine as distinct from Arminian free will sure. Methodist. But um, on some things, they, they, they were, they were um, rather anti-Catholic. That was sort of rather a common factor. Okay. And um, particularly with the, uh, some of the Presbyterian circles that I moved in as a young, uh, as an adolescent and as a university student, there was a very strongly anti-Catholic uh, element there. Which but would have been brought from the homeland from England when, when, the, when the groups came down to, to Australia. Oh yes, of course, because we, we, uh, we started off as a penal colony there right. and a lot of the original co uh, convicts were 
the despised Catholic Irish yeah. in Australia. So with the Anglican establishment there, that was part of our history. Would you have but said that in that upbringing then with, with all, you have Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican and Lutheran, um, do you look back in those days as getting a, a sound foundation for faith in Christ, or did that come later? Well, yes, in, in the in the in the sense that um, uh, where I went to church, um, particularly our Presbyterian church, it wasn't a really liberal. It was a kind of middle of the road Presbyterianism, mm. in which um, certainly uh, personal faith in Jesus Christ was very much emphasized, and. Um, we're talking about the, the early 60s now. A lot of these, the sort of liberal attitudes to moral issues hadn't yeah. come in in many of the churches at that stage. And so uh, I was brought up with my parents gave me a very strong moral foundation, okay. for which I'm always grateful to God. And the sort of basics of what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity, mm -hmm. that was, uh, in fact, part of my experience as a unit. That's one of the things that kept me uh, within a Christian faith during my university years, I became a great devotee of C.S. Lewis's writings. And like millions of others, I found that very helpful in combating the secularism which you have in state universities, and not only state universities these days too. Yeah. So that was, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I had a, a fairly strong, uh, l let's say, basic Christian formation. And so when you were there and teaching in Papua New Guinea, you were there not just as a history teacher, but you had a faith. Oh, oh absolutely. Okay. Very definitely. That, that's why I wanted to be with a Lutheran, uh, right. with a mission, you know, because sure. I could have gone with some, maybe some secular, but I wanted to be with a mission. But um, as I was there with the Lutheran missions, I became, uh, I was taken aback by the fact that these Lutherans, who were the original Protestants, had maintained certain elements in their religion which I had, I'd been brought up to believe were papist superstitions. <laughs> You're talking about the difference between Lutheran and Calvinist now. Where I came from in Australia, there were virtually no... I don't think I'd met a single Lutheran in my life before I went to teach with the Lutheran mission in New Guinea. There were some isolated pockets of German migration to Australia mm. in different places. Here, but where I came from, there was no Lutheran church for hundreds of miles. And so I was surprised to find in New Guinea that um, uh, the Lutherans retained certain practices that, as I say, I'd been taught to regard as sort of uh, these are like uh, they would have crucifixes with the body of Jesus on the cross in classrooms. Lutheran girls would often wear crucifixes round their neck, as Catholic girls do. Uh, well, men too, for that matter. And um, yeah, I don't remember seeing that in my Lutheran background either. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that wonder how that. Well, I wonder how that practice got there. May, maybe uh, this was a sort of a. Uh, you were Lutheran too. Or I was brought up Lutheran. Okay, yeah, and it, 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 they didn't have things like crucifixes. No. Oh well, maybe these were more high church Lutherans Must there. But uh, certainly, the um, uh, I learned that Luther believed that baptism, actual uh, even of infants, remitted original sin. And for Calvinists, it was just merely an outward sign. I thought, gee, this is a either baptism, a, a sacrament that actually has a spiritual effect is a basic Catholic idea, of course. And this is something quite radical to me that the, the, the Luther and the say, oh, sure, baptism remits original sin. And uh, they also believed in a semi-Catholic understanding of the Eucharist. Or you probably remember that, the Luther's idea that the body of Christ is is somehow right. in the bread, yeah. even though only during Over, the moment under, of... Around, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, the bread does not change into the body of Christ, but uh, they believed in an objective presence, and they, this was strongly emphasized in the Lutheran circles that I, I was there in, in Papua New Guinea. And again, this has str struck me as something that this is, this is, uh, this is Romanism, this idea that the, there's an objective presence of Jesus' body in the Eucharist, because I'd been brought to believe, up to believe that this was just a pure symbol of the body and blood of Christ. And to my shock and awe, uh, I also found that the, the Lutheran pastor at the mission school where I was working there in New Guinea, uh, every month they would have a monthly Eucharistic service and he would be available to hear private confessions <laughs> of, the, of the students there before they received communion. And I questioned him about this. He said, oh, yeah, that's the power of the keys. Luther never threw out uh, individual confession. Of course, they don't have the Catholic doctrine and theology of the sacrament of penance. But the actual practice there is a pastoral practice. Uh, 
was always retained by Luther himself and many Lutherans since then. So you come along and you speak to the pastor and he encourages you to have, because faith alone, you know, right. faith alone saves you and he encourages you to have faith that your sins are forgiven. He doesn't forgive sins in the name of uh, our Lord as we have in the Catholic sacrament, but still it was, it was a very Catholic type of practice. And I began to think, gee, these, these are the original Protestants and they're, they're sort of half Catholic in quite a few of these sacramental ideas. It had a, let's say, a being with the Lutherans a couple of years, as I look back on it now, was a kind of stepping stone along the road to Rome mm -hmm. uh, for me. And I began to <coughs> get a little more, uh, my, my sort of uh, sense of alienation or complete... Uh, let's say, repugnance for the evils of so-called Romanism started to diminish gradually. Then about that time, uh, there'd also come back to my uh, memory, let's say, a problem that I'd often had when I was back at, in the Presbyterian youth group and Bible study groups when I was uh, in senior high school and university. Uh, we would have <coughs> our Bible study groups and we'd sit around in groups of, you know, divide up into four or five each, and we'd be discussing a different passage, maybe often from St. Paul. Uh, uh, and uh, I would sometimes go out of those Bible study groups more confused than when I went in <laughs> because I was really getting hit by this problem of who interprets the Bible uh, when we were assured that the Bible alone is the only source of authority. But, you know, you'd sit around discussing some passage in St. Paul's talking about justification or grace or, or maybe something on the Eucharist and uh, you know I think it means this and the next person in the group thinks has a different idea and somebody has and you think well uh, how can we be sure who has that and I thought you know I don't know any Greek uh, you'd really have to know the original languages to be really informed on this and um, and then I realized that even those who do know Greek all the expert theologians of all the different dominations they they all have differing interpretations even on quite fundamental uh, about how do we get to heaven the doctrine of justification and grace um, uh, what's the, what's the meaning of the Eucharist the central act of worship of Christians is in, and what does it actually mean and what happens in this I mean there are radically different interpretations of the scriptures mm -hmm. even on these very important points and so I was becoming let's say even before I went up to New Guinea during my university years I was becoming disillusioned with this idea of the Bible alone mm -hmm. that this this doesn't really uh, it, it doesn't function well and I began to think more and more if, if God really wanted to make himself clear to us, to reveal himself to us, uh, why has he given us just this book? I mean, sure, the Bible is the word of God, and I believed it, and, but um, isn't there some way of knowing what's the right interpretation of this book? And when you don't have any... I, I, I remember at that stage, because a, a young person interested in sports, I thought it's a little like... a. You know, you have a game of rugby or baseball or whatever, you, you, as well as the players on the team, uh, they might know the rules, the written rules of that game perfectly from memory. Um, but just knowing the rules of the game, uh, the <laughs> written rules, there isn't enough to carry out a game successfully because you have to have uh, an umpire, a referee there who's going to apply those rules in concrete cases. You're right, you're wrong. And, and, and if you don't have that person there, the game is going to develop into uh, a punch-up before too long. And I thought, well, it's the same. If, if we don't have any, let's say, referee or umpire who can decide, well, now this interpretation of the Scriptures is wrong and this is right. Yeah, an authoritative umpire. Authoritative uh, interpreter of the Scripture. What's going to happen? Well, what has happened for the last five centuries after the Protestant Reformation, you get... Uh, Protestantism fragmenting into many different groups, each with their own yeah. private interpretation of the scriptures, and this really sort of came home to me, particularly as I said, I'd been um, been brought up with varying denominations, with varying interpretations of the scriptures, and so um, all this was part of my, let's say, uh, gradual search 
I'd come to this point even before I went up to the missions in New Guinea that I thought there's, there's something wrong with this Bible alone idea. And then, as I say, the, uh, the Lutheran mission had this rather Catholicizing effect on me when I saw how these original Protestants had retained quasi, you say quasi in America, I guess, <laughs> Catholic ideas on, some, on the main sacraments, ba- baptism and Eucharist. And um, then another thing hit me. I, I came across the, the fact that not only does the Bible alone principle lead to fragmentation and division with everyone interpreting the Bible in their own way. But I, I realized there's a fundamental contradiction in that idea itself because this, the famous sola scriptura, the principle that the Bible is the only authority, is not itself a scriptural teaching. There is nothing in the, 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 the text of any of the biblical books that says scripture alone is the only source of authority. And we have, of course, Paul in in uh, Second Thessalonians, saying, "Hold fast, brothers, to the what I taught you by word of by 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 letter or by uh, by, oral, by teaching, meaning oral tradition." Right there in the Bible, you had this appeal to oral apostolic tradition as well as what was written, and uh, so this was another influence on me. Mm. By the time I was up there in the uh, in in the Lutheran mission in New Guinea. Uh, another factor that made a big impact me, on me was the fact that when I began to study more closely um, the biblical teachings about grace and justification, and when I began to look at some Catholic explanations of this, I began to realize, you know, these Catholics, they can make out just as good a case, if not better, than the Protestants when they're interpreting a different, especially in, in St. Paul's letters. And of course, I found eventually the famous statement in Second Peter where he says that our brother Paul, with the wisdom given to him, um, says things which the unlearned will uh, interpret badly for their own perdition and, uh, and uh, distort the meaning of, of Paul because he writes things that are, some things that are hard to understand. I, Gee, this is the Bible itself, Sensei Paul, is difficult to understand. And, well, all this was gradually uh, having an effect on me. For a while there in New Guinea then, I began to, uh, I, be- I think this, this Protestant, this Presbyterianism of my upbringing is not, the, uh, is not the answer. And my search was really, uh, let's say, prodded and motivated to, to I, I felt motivated to go deeper into this by the fact that for several years now I had an increasing sense that maybe I was called to become a pastor or a, a minister. And uh, because I, even in spite of all this like, confusion about which is the right denomination, I did have this very basic, you know, central Christian faith, as I said, which had been nourished particularly by the writings of C.S. Lewis in my undergraduate years. And I felt that, yeah, I mean, I had this um, sense that I was being called to become a, a minister of the Word and sacraments and give my life to God in that way. But of course, uh, to do that, you have to be very sure, you know, which nomina- yeah. the denominational <laughs> question becomes absolutely central. If, if you're a sort of uncommitted denominationally, uh, you have to commit to a denomination if you're going to be a, a clergyman. Well, in some seminaries, and, uh, like the seminary I went to, you could go non-committed and figure by the time you got done, you'd, you'd figure that out at seminary. Oh, really? Yeah, at uh, the seminary actually where Scott Hahn and I both went together. That's where it was. Oh, right. A lot of people came not, not really committed. Something fascinates me about your story here that I want to make sure we don't miss, and that mm-hmm. is that you're going through all of this discernment in the bush. Yeah, well, it's, it, this is... Um, you're, you're working with some of the most primitive people in the world, aren't you? I, well, uh, the, the central highlands of New Guinea was literally the last inhabited part of Earth's surface to be contacted by outsiders. Hmm. Right until the midnight... We talk about darkest Africa, you know, Livingston, that was back in... penetrated back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But right up till the 1930s, the central highlands of New Guinea were unknown to outside. People didn't even know that those big mountain valleys up there were thickly populated. And when I got there, it was only 30, this is in the 60s, it was only 30 years after the first outsiders had come in. 
and the people were just coming out of cannibalism there and the Stone Age. And so it was, uh, I was teaching in a mission, Lutheran Mission High School where the students there were the very first generation ever to have um, a high school education. And a lot of their parents were people who had been uh, born and brought up without even, uh, they'd all seen white men by now, but they'd been born and brought up, let's say, without even seeing a white man. And so, yes, it was, uh, uh, that was very much, although I have to uh, qualify that a little bit. My first years in New Guinea were there out in the central highlands. By the time I came into the church, I was, uh, I'd moved to a different position down on, uh, at Ley on the northeast coast of New Guinea, which had had contact with outside culture for a much longer period. Okay. But still, all, all in all, Papua New Guinea was uh, certainly very in a very underdeveloped country. So, See, I was thinking that uh, I know that historically when Columbus and some of the explorers discovered North America at the end of the 15th century, that, that had a big impact on theology because all of a sudden they're face to face with people that had never heard the gospel. And in the 1400s they had thought, well, that's everybody's heard. Yeah. So yeah. all of a sudden they've encountered people that have never heard, so it, put a, it made them re-examine salvation outside the church. What do we mean by this? And I'm thinking even your own personal journey, you're dealing with issues of salvation with people yeah. that have never heard Christ before. Well, that, that's right. That was... Um, it was all a, something that motivated me more to, yeah. to pr pursue with this sense of a, a vocation that I had to dedicate my life in, in some way to the service of the gospel. So you have to go but, back to the mainland then to, cons well, to I, I, well, well, I'll, I'll tell you how it happened. I, I became a Catholic up there in New Guinea. and um, Before you decided on, on, on the call to the priesthood? Yes, you, okay. yeah, right. yeah, right. definitely. Um, for a little while, I just, uh, after I became quite disillusioned with this sola scriptura principle, I, for a little while, attended a high church Anglican uh, mission church there in, in Leh, Papua New Guinea. But then I, uh, I came to see that this, isn't, this is sort of like a, a halfway house. It isn't really too consistent. I mean, they're, they're the Anglo-Catholics... I have great respect for them, and of course the Holy Father has recently published his constitution to welcome those traditional Anglicans into the church, but still that, that for me wasn't the answer. If we have more time, let's see how time I can maybe get there. But in any case, Second that thing. was a, a temporary phase. Then uh, one of the things that really made a big impact me was a big impact on my conversion was a completely different matter that I haven't mentioned yet. We're talking about the early 70s here, 70, 71, I eventually came in 72. This was the period immediately after hmm. Paul VI issued Humanae Vitae. And of course, uh, there was a tremendous um, uh, reaction to that encyclical, not only, of course, from the secular world, the outside, those outside who almost universally denounced and condemned the Pope for this reactionary decision, but also, unfortunately, of course, many within the Catholic Church. I remember hearing on the news in 1968, uh, up in the, this was, I was still up in the central highlands of New Guinea, the news that Paul VI had just reaffirmed the Catholic teaching on contraception. My immediate reaction as a Protestant was, you know, what's news about that? This, this is, you know, dog bites man. I mean, we all know that the Catholic Church doesn't accept contrary. What's, what's such big news about the fact that the Church is not changing? Uh, if he changed the teaching, I thought, that, well, that would be big news. But <laughs> the fact that he's repeated the teaching, and why is that such big news? Everyone knows those Catholics don't accept the pill and condoms and so on. And I had never questioned uh, up till about that time uh, the idea that, well, sure, pills, why not? Contra what's wrong with contraceptives? Uh, like most Protestants, or I just kind of took it for granted. That's no big deal. I couldn't find anything particularly in the Scriptures that really um, uh, dealt with that. Um, but anyway, that was 68. Just about that time, 69, 70, the militant homosexual what was then called Gay Lib, Gay Liberation Movement, began to take uh, on a great momentum beginning here in the United States. I think last year in 2009, 29, they, they had their 40th anniversary of this stone wall, the, the thing where they had a, which was like an iconic beginning of the homosexual um, 
activist movement in 40 years ago last year. But I began to think about this and uh, the more I thought and reflected about the claims and arguments of the homosexual liberation movement, I began to think, hey, there's a, there's a, there's a connection here mm. with uh, the whole issue of contraception, the whole issue of uh, is there such a thing as a natural order in the sexual relationship between man and wife? Is that whole concept of what is natural, un is there any meaning to that at all? And, of course, one of the arguments that the militant homosexuals were, were bringing up was that um, they were saying, hey, you, you, you straights, you know, you condemn our lifestyle, you're inconsistent. And they were saying, many of them, you claim that gay sex is unnatural, but you already accept other practices that are not natural. What's natural about using a condom or a pill uh, yeah. or other contraceptive techniques uh, these are also practices that exclude the possibility of procreation. Therefore, how can you say that gay sex is wrong because it, you know, it excludes the possibility of procreation? You're al already accepting practices that um, uh, rule that possibility out, and therefore you're, you're inconsistent. And I thought, well, now, th th there's, there's definitely a certain logic to that. And... Um, I began to think, gee, once we accept contraceptive practices, we are in fact opening the door to a whole lot of practices that r really there's no limit to where you're going to stop. Once you, once you say that this idea of a, of a natural order uh, in this intimate relationship of marriage is, is something irrelevant then you're opening the door to a whole lot of things, some of which I wouldn't want to even want to mention. In a, I mean, there, there are just ob obviously all sorts of more obvious sexual perversions. Yeah. And um, this made a big impact on me. And I began to realize that uh, that old guy in Rome who everyone was attacking, I said, gee, you know, I think he's right on this. <laughs> and if he's right about that, what else is he right about? <laughs> and, 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 and it became for me a sign of credibility. For, for so many people in, in the modern world today, the church's teaching against contraception is a stumbling block. It's an obstacle. They say, this is out of date. The church has got to change that. It's completely wrong. For me, as I began to reflect and pray about that issue, it became for me a sign of credibility that the church was out there uh, as I began to see it now. The gospel talks about the city set on the hill and, and the, uh, in spite of the, um, of course, we've seen in recent times all too much of actual uh, terrible abuses yeah. carried out, unfortunately, by those with leadership in the Catholic Church. But the teaching, the doctrine, has always remained completely firm on this issue. And, of course, that was what interested me in searching for the truth. It's not whether how well Catholics live up to their own... But wh what is the truth? What is the doctrine that, that, that God wants me to accept? Uh, and uh, regardless of whether uh, people in all different churches fail to live up to the, the, their own doctrines, that to me was not such a... And, of course, back at that time, people weren't aware of these scandals that have come to light uh, in recent times. Father, when we break there, that's a great place to break. We'll come back in a moment because... Uh, I mean, you're impressed by the Catholic Church holding firm. And I want to talk when we get back, take up from there, because it wasn't you're impressed that the church was being stubborn. No. It's that the church was dealing with order. Yeah. And let's talk about that when we get back yeah. in our break. See you then.
Welcome back to the journey home. Father Brian, uh, we, we, just, we just took a break there. We're in the middle of recognizing that you were um, really appreciating what Paul VI had done, and that was an awakening for you that his, and I had mentioned, just, just as a clarification, it wasn't that you were impressed by the stubbornness of the Catholic Church, but that it was really the, the, the order that the yes, Church the, 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 the Catholic Church was standing up for uh, the natural order in the transmission of human life, and of course this is also connected very much with um, uh, the abortion issue, which around that time was building, uh, taking on a lot of steam, and of course Roe versus Wade came out just the year after I, ca I came into the church in 1972. But yes, the, uh, uh, the witness of, of Paul the Sixth encyclical became for me a sign of credibility of mm -hmm. the Catholic Church, because I saw that once you... Um, and I, this is an anecdote that's interesting. My, one of my family members, my sister, uh, who was and is a, a, a committed evangelical Protestant, but back at the... Uh, I remember making the point to her at that time, look, once you accept contraceptives, logically you're going to have to accept homosexual activity. I mean, it's, it's, once you say that there is the natural order that you don't have to, the husband and wife do not have to have intercourse in the, that there's a natural way, a natural act that's just open to procreation. And if you're going to say that you don't have to do it that way, where are you going to stop? You're going to have to eventually um, uh, admit all kinds of other practices, some of which are more obviously perverse than others, but you're opening the way for them. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, homosexuality, that, that, that's obviously, you know, wrong and unnatural and oh, I wouldn't dream of that. Now, th this was 1972. 35 years later, my sister has realized that the, uh, you know, there's the logic of that. And unfortunately, um, she, uh, rather than converting, she, she now accepts the, the whole gay yeah. scenario and gay marriage, that's fine. Yeah. But I mean, the logic is there. As did all the denominations that at one point accepted contraception, almost all those denominations have gone. Well, exactly. Yeah. So this, this was, let's say, the, uh, the final, um, the thing that kind of clinched it for me. All these other uh, doubts I've been having in other areas, the whole problem with the sola scriptura, the fact that the Bible can very much be under the whole question of justification, faith, works, and so on. The Catholics, uh, I realize, can make just as good, if not a better case from the scriptures as the as Lutheran, the Calvinist tradition did. So uh, I became a Catholic in the Easter Vigil 1972 up there in Papua New Guinea. Uh, while I was still teaching at the Lutheran uh, <laughs> Teachers College, Teachers Training College there, so I was a bit of a, a Trojan. They accepted me in as a Protestant. I went, I know, no, no. I'd only been there six months, and then I became a Catholic. But unfortunately, it was, a, it was an ecumenical attitude there, and there were a number of Catholic students in the teacher's I college. I was wondering, so, had, had you encountered any Catholic missionaries there in your work while you were in Pavanui? Really, uh, well, only the local church that I started going to okay. uh, in Ley, Papua New Guinea, but unfortunately, the missionaries there were very, they were Dutch missionaries and taking on board all the Dutch catechism, which was mm. a notorious, uh, very liberal and dissident uh, teaching instrument that was very much in favor back in the late 60s there. And really, uh, if I'd taken too much notice of what those Dutch missionaries were telling me, I probably would not have converted anyway. But <laughs> I was, um, I, I came in basically through my own prayer and study of the, and uh, reading things like Newman and Chester and helped me along the road too but um, I really didn't have much to do I mean I attended mass on Sundays and I made my first communion there in the local Catholic church of course but I didn't have much to do with the the Catholic missions as such but um, what about the, the what had come and gone during that period was the council itself had that yes. had an effect on you well I, in retrospect I would say yes I think that it, it helped me even though, of course, after the council, there was this tremendous outbreak of confusion and dissent and, you know, false interpretations of the council. And I was aware of that when I came in because uh, I was aware that I was coming into a, a church that was not at all sort of strongly united by that stage. But I, my, my basic focus was, well, now I know what the, 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 the authentic doctrine of the church is and I'm going to 
uh, that this, I'm coming into the church because of that, no matter if some people, are, a lot of people are descending from it. So, But yes, the council, I think, did help me in spite of the fact that it also produced a lot of that confusion because um, the Catholic Church after Vatican II certainly showed a more welcoming and uh, positive uh, approach to we to us separated brethren yeah. uh, as I was before that time to a large extent the church of the 40s and 50s the Catholic Church was presented a very forbidding and severe image to I mean it was it tended to be very much emphasizing the errors the wrong things what's wrong with the Protestants and and all your heresies and errors and this kind of thing and I mean that's right as far as it goes. There are errors and, 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 and th that need to be uh, addressed. But uh, the Vatican II decree on ecumenism uh, had a very different tone, a very different approach, and it recognizes the fact that um, the Holy Spirit does work in, and, and that uh, our separated brethren have maintained many elements of the faith and uh, that we recognize whatever is... Uh, true and good and and that sort of uh came home to me because i mean i was not reacting against protestantism in a kind of negative uh let's say uh reaction that made me feel bitter or hostile towards my protestant family and friends quite the contrary uh, i recognized them as being uh, the people that i'd brought been brought up with my family the lutheran people in the mission I recognized them as uh, people who are with Jesus Christ and were sincerely following his will. And, uh, you know, I, you could see the works of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in many of the aspects of their life and the, what they were doing for the people there. And uh, so uh, I was very much aware that there is a great deal of good in uh, all the, the, the non Catholic uh, churches there, particularly those who had maintained the historic Christianity, the, the, the kind of C.S. Lewis mere Christianity with the authentic moral teachings, the kind of uh, brethren that we have now in the evangelical denominations yep. who, of course, are very much with us on pro-life and marriage and family issues. I recognized mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, I mean, I'd been part of that myself, that yes, sure, the Holy Spirit is there. And Vatican Council, too, recognized that, uh, the positive, what there is of positive value mm -hmm. in the other denominations in a way that the Preconciliar Vatican Church didn't so much. It was tended to be very much of the sort of, to be, you guys are wrong and you've and you got to convert and look at all your errors and heresies and that. And so I think, yes, that the, the ecumenical attitude did help me. It, 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 let's say it, um, it facilitated the change yeah. because, as I said, I came from a very anti-Catholic uh, upbringing and it was quite a, a jolt for me to, to change. Um, uh, and uh, the fact that the church I was coming into recognized now more officially and more clearly that the, yeah, there's a great deal of good yep. in the other denominations there. This was something that helped me. Something else I know you've written on, and I, I'd like you to talk about this, and that is the continuity of the council with the traditional teaching of the church. I think many who have, have taken the, the council to mean other things than it was intended try to imply that what the council was doing is said, well, now we can jettison what's come before and we can start afresh rather than recognize right. that the council was standing on the shoulders. Yeah, exactly. Yes, the, um, the present pope uh, in a famous allocution to the College of Cardinals just in the first Christmas after he was elected emphasized what he called famously now the hermeneutic of continuity. We have to understand Vatican Council II not as a rupture or a break with the previous tradition but as building on the, two, the bimillennial tradition, understanding the council in continuity with what went before. That has been very, very important for me in my life as a Catholic. Uh, we haven't talked about my road yet to the priesthood oh, after sure. I became a Catholic, yeah. but just to cu cut a long story short there, uh, I have become, uh, I'm a diocesan priest, but I belong to an association of diocesan priests called the Oblates of Wisdom, which has its own rule and spirituality. Um, and our particular charism is to promote and search for the authentic wisdom that comes from above 
than the Gospels, the teaching of the church, the lives of the saints, at a time when there is so much false wisdom <laughs> and so many false prophets in the contemporary world uh, and false, you know, false pseudo was even within the church herself. And so uh, one of the emphases in our community, the Oblates of Wisdom, which was founded by an American priest, Monsignor John McCarthy, with whom I work now in St. Louis uh, at our uh, central house there. One of our central uh, aims is to be completely faithful to Vatican Council II, but to understand, apply, and interpret the Council in the spirit of continuity with the great bimillennial tradition that has preceded it. And uh, when I studied for the priesthood, I began in Sydney, and I finished up in Rome. That's another story. We'll see if we have time to get to that. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I finished up studying uh, at, the, at the Angelicum, the University of St. Thomas in Rome. And I did my license uh, the, for my license in theology uh, on the continuity in doctrine between Vatican Council II and the previous teaching on the question of religious liberty. The Declaration Dignitatis Humanae of the Council has been one of the most controversial of the whole Council, of all of the Council's documents, because, um, as you know, those at sort of both the liberal extreme and the traditionalist extreme have both said, well, this contradicts the Church's previous teaching. And those on the liberal end of the spectrum, I remember back at the time I was... Well, I was going to say it might be good to tell the audience what specific that document is, is addressing. Uh, Dignitatis Humanae is the Council's Declaration on Religious Liberty. And uh, the, the essentially new development in this is, is the explicit recognition that when it comes to uh, the relationship between government and religion, the Catholic religion is not the only religion that is entitled to civil freedom. Um, uh, in other words, the, uh, the, uh, it's not true to say that uh, it's always just for the state to repress the public exercise of every other religion except Roman Catholicism. Now, this was the tendency for a long time, of course, and we can go right back to the Middle Ages when we had the Inquisition and so on. Uh, there's no time now. to. It's a very involved and complex issue. We haven't got time to go into the details. But... Um, Basically, my thesis was arguing that you have to make, when you make the right distinctions between what's a matter of policy, what's a matter of doctrine, what the council exactly says, what it doesn't say, we can see there is an underlying, underlying continuity there of doctrine, even though the council clarified something which had been left ambiguous or unclear in the previous teachings, namely that uh, under certain conditions, yes, uh, even uh, a religion that is... Uh, not the true religion, the people who follow that also have the right to immunity from coercion by government. Uh, it's, it's, it's very much a question. It's not saying you have a, a moral right to believe any religion, whatever you like, or whether it's true or false. No, it's talking about relations in civil society, hmm. that there's a right to immunity from coercion by government, uh, except where there are clear dangers to public morality, public peace, or other rights of citizens. This is what the Council is saying, and I've been saying that the, this is, you can understand this in continuity with the traditional yeah. doctrine. Which would, would seem to uh, fit with, we know that John, that uh, Charles Carroll and John Carroll, the Catholics during the Amer American Revolution, were very strong proponents of the separation of church and state that was expressed in our documents are found in country. It seemed to me that they were basing that on some of these ideas. So obviously some of those ideas were around 200 years ago. They were opposed to, to union of church and state or separation. They were, they were saying that the government has no right. Oh, okay. To, okay. Well, yeah, in, in that, and of course in the American context, particularly yeah. where you have uh, Catholics are a small minority, or they were back, well, still a right. very much a minority, and you have a majority of non-Catholics, obviously there could be no question of... Um, uh, of, of uh, Catholicism being the official state religion. And, uh, but on the other hand, the council does not abandon, as many uh, erroneously interpret the council, the, ca uh, the council did not say that it's wrong to have uh, a Catholic, uh, an officially Catholic nation or state. Uh, to this very day, the Dominican Republic, Malta, Costa Rica, 
several of the small little pocket principalities like Liechtenstein, Mon there are still officially Catholic nations uh, recognized as such with Vatican approval, but they allow freedom for the other denominations as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's still very uh, meaningful because it means that the Catholic, for instance, in the state schools in those countries, you'll have the, the Catholic religion being taught. The, the, there'll be official... Uh, public holidays for feasts of our lay there's a whole lot of areas in which you can have a nation officially recognizing catholicism when there's a great majority of the people are catholic but at the same time respecting the liberty of the minority groups but anyway, this, this was uh, yeah that was my um uh, uh my license uh, thesis then for my doctoral thesis uh i did an uh, uh, i did a study of and this would be something of interest. Uh, many of our readers are not, uh, many, I'm sorry, many of our viewers, uh, 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 we have uh, uh, Protestant and Anglican right. and brethren uh, who are very interested in the role of Scripture. Well, now, Vatican II also emphasized very much the role of sacred Scripture in the life of the church and gave that a, a new impetus. And my doctoral thesis was a study of the, the teachings of Pope Paul VI, who was the Pope of the Council, on sacred scripture and I wanted to see how he interpreted the, by the way he quoted sacred scripture the way he appealed to it uh, in, in his encyclicals in his talks in his documents in his ordinary magisterium um, how did he understand the council's teaching on scripture and divine revelation the council of course one of its major documents is Dei Verbum, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, and a great part of that document is about sacred scripture. Unfortunately, we've often, since the Council, had, um, again, false interpretations of that uh, document, which would put it in conflict with uh, the previous teaching of all the popes who'd insisted that sacred scripture, once it's clearly understood in accordance with the author's intentions, is free from error. That doesn't mean there, everything in the Bible is to be taken literally. But once you understand what the author was saying and using the literary genre that is not necessarily so obvious to perhaps to modern readers at times, but once you understand what the sacred writer is saying, then this, this, is, this is also being affirmed by the Holy Spirit. It is free from error, the inerrancy of sacred scripture. And I did my doctoral thesis about Paul's teaching on that and other aspects of the scriptures, particularly the historicity of the Gospels. This has been another area in it's which really pseudo-biblical scholarship infected by rationalist liberal Protestant tendencies, going back to people like Rudolf Bultmann right. and uh, those who uh, uh, deny the supernatural and they will tend to demythologize the Gospels and say the supernatural elements in these are really kind of mythical additions and the early church kind of built this um, this story up and you really uh, you, you really can't believe in the, the integral historicity of the Gospels. That in, in Dei Verbum number 19 the council reaffirmed very strongly the integral historical truth of the Gospels and I found that um, even though lots of the, the biblical experts in the Catholic Academy have really kind of uh, diminished that and, and reduced the historical credibility of the Gospels. But in my thesis, I emphasize that Paul VI, I went through everything he said mm. just about, I, I read through every single document of his, and I picked where he talking about the histories of the God, particularly those parts of the Gospels that are the first to get <laughs> reduced, the, the infancy narratives, right. the resurrection narratives, uh, the Last Supper discourse in John, um, the John 13 up to 17, and other parts of the Gospels that the modern critics are very quick to say, well, this never really happened, and Jesus never really said this and that. So I went through this, and I found that, uh, and I've emphasized my doctoral thesis, that Paul VI, in quoting these, um, the doings and the sayings of our Lord, always, without exception, understood them to be this is what Jesus really did and said. Yeah. And it's, I think it's very important at a time when so many, in, in a lot of so-called Catholic universities, there are biblical scholars who are saying, well, you know, the Gospels, they don't, they're not really Gospel truth. They're, they're, they're in some kind of other semi-mythical or, or a creative literary genre, and you can't really believe what the Gospels are saying as the words and deeds of Jesus. 
the council says they are the words and deeds of Jesus. Article number 19. And Paul VI, the Pope of Vatican II, the first signatory, the one whose interpretation of the council carries more weight than that of the academic experts, he understood and preached the, um, uh, the, the, the Gospels as true and authentic records of what Jesus really did and said. Uh, the same thing with John Paul. That went beyond the scope of my own thesis. But for instance, uh, if you look at John Paul II's apostolic exhortation about St. Joseph, he's dealing with the infancy narratives, particularly in St. Matthew, which is one of the very first passages of the Gospels that the critics will say, oh, this really never happened. The wise men were never there, the, the, um, the flight to Egypt, all that kind of thing, that, her that, that really didn't happen. If you look at John Paul II's uh, in sick, uh, his apostolic exhortation about St. Joseph, he clearly affirms the historicity of what Matthew tells us about the infancy of our Lord and Joseph's role in that. This is a very important point that I want to make sure our audience hears because what you're saying from the data is that contrary to what the kind of books you might find in your average bookstore laying around, which are often just from that more critical side, yeah. that all the popes in our lifetime, yeah. including the consul, have affirmed the historicity of yeah, the Gospels it, and it, the New Testament. It, question. Yeah, it, it, it's very important that our Protestant brothers, our evangelical Protestants who value and treasure the, the Scriptures so much, they understand the official teaching of the Catholic Church, no matter how many dissonance there may be, the, the official teaching of the Church is that the uh, the Gospels are real history. They tell us uh, yeah. reliably what Jesus really didn't taught for our salvation. Until the day he was taken up, the council added those words to make it clear that the resurrection narratives too are to be understood as historical. This is absolutely crucial also when so much of our understanding of, of Christian moral teaching is based on the teachings of Jesus, of the life of Christ. Yeah. You start undercutting that and that just explains why the moral teachings well, start getting uh, undercut. Uh, right yes, exactly. There, there are now huge big scholarly tomes written trying to prove that um, homosexual activity is quite in line with the scriptures. I mean, it, it's a lot of sophistry and I mean, it, you, you, of course, there's been other excellent yeah. works written by biblical scholars to rebut that and to uphold the authentic teaching of the uh, the scriptures and the church on sexuality and marriage. But yes, I mean, once you start undermining the biblical teaching in one area, you're undermining it on, uh, on morals as well as faith. Well, the time goes very quickly in this program, Father. I want to, at the end, we have a minute to go. When we get to a minute to go, I want you to, to say a blessing for us. But I also want, just for the audience, what are you doing now? Are you here in the States now? Yes, I, for many years I was teaching at the Catholic University of Puerto Rico. And I came up to St. Louis, Missouri, two, two and a half years ago. That's what I'm stationed at the moment. I'm spending my time now, especially helping our, our, the founder and director of the Oblates of Wisdom there in, in our study center there. So I'm doing most of my time studying and writing. And I'm busy at weekends, uh, uh, helping out in different parish with masses in English uh, and Spanish also, and some Latin. Uh, we celebrate in the, the different forms of the, the yeah. extraordinary rite. I often celebrate, usually celebrate on weekdays, and on Sundays we have a Latin sung Novus Ordo Mass. Yeah. Again, to show the continuity, you can yeah. celebrate the new Mass in a way that really brings out the continuity with, the, yeah. uh, with tradition in facing the East, so to speak, and uh, uh, using Gregorian chant from, again, with the new Missal, but uh, right. in traditional options. That, that's yeah. basically my apostle at the moment. All right. Could I ask you to, to give us a blessing as we close on the program? <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to reflect on your revelation to us, your making yourself known in Jesus Christ, and in the fact that you have left behind us the Catholic Church founded by Jesus to last to the end of the world, to give us the fullness of your revelation and with your promise that the Catholic Church will be maintained in truth by the Holy Spirit until the end of the world in spite of whatever sins and stains that individual members can bring to her. We thank you for this gift of your church. We thank you for the opportunity to speak and spread your word on this program. We pray for your blessing especially on the whole work of EWTN that this ministry may be source of light and blessing and grace and truth to many in this country and throughout the world. 
the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Brian. Okay. Appreciate that very much. Yeah. You do a fair amount of the Internet. Is there any, if, if they wanted to find out some of your writings, the Internet is a place for them to go? Uh, yes, I can give you our, our, our website. Uh, um, are, we, are we still on camera? Yeah, real quickly. Oh, yeah. www.rtforum.org. Uh, RT, that stands for Roman oh. Theological Forum. All right. Thank you very much, Father. Okay. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. See you soon.